How many times did you say today, thank you to the giver of all good things? If you answered that 687.4, it would not have been enough. The reality is we ought to be grateful people. The topic for this morning's equipping hour is simply that, gratitude. Gratitude. It is an essential Christian mindset. But I would go further and say that it is an essential human mindset. For to exist is fundamentally to be dependent on the one who brought you into existence and sustains your existence. Gratefulness ought to be on the lips and in the hearts of every creature. That's what we want to talk about this morning. We want to assess our own attitudes. We want to assess where we are weak in this area, where we need to grow. And to do that this morning, we'll begin with the opposite of gratitude, ingratitude. This is the fundamental characteristic of unbelief. I want you to see this in Romans chapter 1. I want you to recognize what you were saved from. If you are in Christ, you are, hello, Marissa and the Chang Yu. It's really good to see you. I'll embarrass you even more in the main service, but we're so glad that you're here and congratulations. In Romans chapter one, we get to have a picture of what it was like to be outside of Christ. In case you have forgotten, Look at Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also for the Greek. Why is the gospel power for salvation? Because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is made known or revealed or manifested. Thoroughly from first to last by faith, this righteousness comes. Well, why do we need the righteousness of God? Verse 18 tells us, because the wrath of God is made known from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel? Because the gospel provides righteousness by faith. Why do we need righteousness by faith? Because the wrath of God is being made known against our ungodliness. And then the rest of Romans chapter 1 just describes the downward spiral of that ungodliness as we in our natural condition suppressed the truth of God, the truth of God revealed externally and internally in the stars, and if you saw it this weekend, the aurora borealis over the skies in Arizona, and in the conscience that <clears throat> man stuffs in a box in his sin and tries to hide, and yet it is always true. This produces the insanity of knowing what's true and suppressing that truth and unrighteousness, producing the downward spiral of depravity in Romans 1. Look at verse 21. Even though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or give thanks. This is a fundamental attitude of unbelief, ingratitude. Failing to give God the glory He is due is juxtaposed with failing to say, thank you, God. And it is in the vice list of Romans 1 that provokes the wrath of God unto eternal judgment. All by itself, this thanklessness is worthy of eternal justice. Look down at verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, what is the consequence of the ingratitude in Romans 1? A giving over to further sin and degradation. Look down at chapter 2 of Romans, beginning in verse 3. Do you presume this, O man, who passes judgment on those who practice these things and does the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? And here, Paul has turned the corner to talk about Jews and the religious and those who would hold up their own morality, still rejecting the righteousness of God by faith, but thinking, I'm not as bad as that downward spiral of depravity in Romans 1. I'm religious. I'm good. And Paul indicts them all. He says, do you not understand you're doing the same things from the heart? Will you escape the judgment of God? 
Or, verse 4, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads to repentance? This is another flavor of ingratitude, though, from the religious side, uh, taking light of God's patience. We ought to express gratitude that God doesn't bundle us all up with all of the wicked immediately and give us what we deserve. Verse 5, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of the wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will repay to each according to his deeds. This is a stunning observation to see in in all of the things that describe wicked man in his outward rebellion against God and in his religious rebellion against God, this ingratitude leading to eternal judgment. Listen to Luke 6.35. These are Jesus' words. He says, love your enemies, do good, and lend. Expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. Why is, all, why is all of that true? Because you'll be like God. Jesus says, for God himself is kind to ungrateful, evil men. God is kind to the ungrateful. What does that tell us? For all of human history, we sorry ingrates have been loved by God. Lavishly. God has been so patient, so kind, to give and give and give when nobody realizes or acknowledges who's doing the giving. A a totally thankless work from God that will not, of course, go on forever. We just read God will bring out His eternal justice against that ingratitude one day. 2 Timothy 3.2 says, Men in the future, as the world gets worse and worse, they will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. Again, what is in this vice list of the downward slide of humanity and its further rebellion against God as we get to the end of time? Ingratitude, right there in the list. What does ingratitude expose in the human heart? Ingratitude reveals something about the condition of the inner man. It it also reveals something about our theology, what we believe. And, And we might have creedal statements, we might have orthodox doctrinal statements, but your three your theology is actually revealed not in what you subscribe to, not what's on the website of the church you attend, but how you live. That is the real test of your theology. So what does ingratitude expose in our hearts? What does it reveal about our theology? Ingratitude at its bottom is essentially atheistic. It is the denial of God's existence. It is a mindset of unbelief. It is a godless perspective. It is a rank independence. If I'm not thanking God... I'm acting independent of God. I'm saying, I got this. I have the resources. I have what it takes. It's not a life of faith. It's a life of infidelity to God. It's a life of self-sufficiency. It's a life of faithlessness. In the end, this is what unbelief is. Ingratitude is entitlement. It is the notion that I deserve the good things that come into my life. Complaining, the flip side of gratitude, is the entitlement that says, I don't deserve the bad things that are coming into my life. I get to define what's good and bad for me. I get to complain about those things I don't want. And I get to take credit for the things that I have made for myself. It really is a a rank godlessness in the heart. Ingratitude is also a a really remarkable situational unawareness. We talk about situational awareness. It's being aware of the things going on around you. How am I situated? What's going on? If you're in traffic, your head's on a swivel. You know what everybody's doing. You're checking your mirrors all the time. You're anticipating everybody else's moves. You're paying attention. But ingratitude is a life of situational unawareness, 
I am self-absorbed of the good things that I've done for myself and the bad things that happen to me are, are all about my entitlement, what I think I deserve and don't deserve. When you grow up in your home, you're a kid. You start out little. You start out little in your thinking. You start out very dependent, but unaware of the levels of your dependence. Moms know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you can see it on your kids' faces when they, when they sort of have these thoughts that come out in life. I don't know how this food got to the table, but I'm going to eat it. I don't know how these groceries got here from the store, and somehow the drawers in my room are filled with clean clothes. <laughs> I, I throw them down the laundry chute, and they show up back in my drawers. And when they don't, something's wrong with the universe. Why aren't the clothes cleaning themselves? <laughs> Mother's Day is a good day to think about ingratitude. You see, college kids learn that laundry has to be done, that groceries must be purchased, that food must be prepared, that food preparation creates messes that must be cleaned. And it's not until you leave the house that you start to feel the gratitude for a mom that you should. It took me a lot longer than leaving the house. I still don't actually get it. Moms are largely unthanked in our world. But God is nearly entirely ignored. A mom we can see, we set out a day to recognize. But even at Thanksgiving in November, what are we doing? Reading birds and watching football. Is it, is it a time that reflects an entire life of gratitude to the giver of all good things? Or does it at times become a holiday for self-indulgence all over again? James 1.17 is clear. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In his sermon in Acts 17... Paul says this, the God who made the world and all things in it. Here's Paul boldly speaking to the unbelieving world. He made everything. He made everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. He is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Recognize that the God of the Bible is not some regional deity. He's not an American God. He's not a Western God. He's not a Middle Eastern deity. He's not a Hebrew God. He is the one true God over all things. He made everything and he gives every perfect gift. And, and every culture and every nation and every language and all the worshipers of all other phony gods have the one true God rightfully to thank for everything. And naturally, we don't. We worship and serve the created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. We give thanks to ourselves for our achievements. Really, ingratitude at the level of unbelief in the human heart rises to the level of cosmic treason by dethroning God, telling Him He's not in charge, and if He is in charge of some things, He's in charge of the bad things that come into my life, and He is to be blamed for them. Every time we go about complaining of our circumstances, we are in essence running up the flagpole a complaint against the God of the universe who providentially orders all of our circumstances. And we are so slow to give God credit, though we owe Him every heartbeat, every breath, every step on his green earth. All of it belongs to him, and he is to be thanked. What does ingratitude produce in our lives? It produces the grumbling and the murmuring and the complaining. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Numbers, chapters 11, chapter 11.
Ingratitude is the heart attitude that produces the outward speech sins that come out in this chapter. Look at verse 1. Now the people became like those who complain of calamity in the ears of Yahweh, and Yahweh heard it, and his anger was kindled. Right? When, when I'm driving in my car and that guy pulls out in front of me, with the doors closed and the window rolled up and the air conditioning going, surely God can't hear my complaint. <laughs> he heard it before I spoke it. My ingratitude is on display long before the words come out of my mouth. And in Numbers 11, this was true for the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. And think about this scene. They have been provided for every single day. By the time you get to the end of the story, 40 years later, their clothes have not worn out. Their sandals have not worn through. They've had three squares and water to drink everywhere they've gone. And they complained not, not to mention the, the setting for this wilderness trek, which was supposed to be a couple of months, turned into the deaths of a generation of re rebels and a 40-year wandering. But they had come out of Egyptian slavery. Do you remember why numbers exist? It, it follows after Exodus and Leviticus. This is God rescuing his people out of bondage that they complained about while they were under it and then constituting them as a nation to be specially loved, protected, provisioned, and governed by God Himself, who, who could stand up against Him? What a great privilege this was. And then to be ushered into a land of promise, a, a land of verdant hills and uh, agriculture that provided for the people. And listen to their complaining Verse 4, the rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and the sons of Israel wept and said, who will give us meat to eat? So notice what's underneath this complaint, this ingratitude, is a greed, a coveting, greedy desires, and it resulted in an emotional outburst. They were weeping. We just want meat. Look at verse 5. We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. What was free about Egypt? <laughs> there was nothing free about Egypt. They were slaves. And we had cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic and more bricks, less straw. <laughs> and the oppression of Egyptian tyranny. They've forgotten. To, to walk around in the, in the sands brings back, oh, remember the good old days. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, don't say that. That is not from wisdom. You, you fantasize about the good things. You conjure up memories that didn't even comport with reality because you're complaining about the present. And you're not seeing the provision and protection that God has for you every day. Look at verse 6. Now our appetite has dried up. There's nothing at all to look at except this glorious heavenly bread that God just makes arrive in front of us every single day. It's amazing. That's not what they say. And if you've heard the Keith Green song about this, he's singing about all the different ways they prepared the manna. Uh, we get this here in the text. They could boil it, bake it, fry it, make tacos. Keith Green says they made banana bread. You know, they had plenty to eat. This was the provision of the Lord. It was so kind of Him. Look down at verse 10. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, each man at the doorway of his tent. Notice the ingratitude becomes contagious. This is going through the families. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled greatly, and it was evil in the sight of Moses. Look down at verse 20. A whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, God says, I will give you meat because you have rejected Yahweh. Isn't that an interesting connection? What is their ingratitude? I hate my situation means I hate Yahweh. 
who in his love put me in this situation. This, this ingratitude is very vertical. It is theological. It is a pragmatic atheism. Worse than an atheism, it, it's, a, it's a recognition that Yahweh exists and I just don't like him. I'd like him dethroned. I don't like what he's doing. Look at verse 33. While the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against the people, and Yahweh struck the people with a very severe plague. So the name of that place was called the Graves of Greediness, Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had been greedy. We should name places like that. That's where I sin, and that way I'm going to call it my sin. This was ingratitude finding its way in, into complaint against Yahweh. Look at chapter 14 of Numbers. Verse 26. Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? This raises the stakes on our ingratitude. This is an evil that God hates. I have heard the complaints against the sons of Israel. I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Say to them, as I live, declares Yahweh, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to the complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. And in the next verse, you will not come into the land. There are long enduring consequences for this ingratitude. Ingratitude produces the grumbling, murmuring, the complaining, a settled bitterness in the heart. Listen, if you're not thankful, there's no neutral here. You, you will be complaining. And that complaint in a moment settles into a lasting bitterness. A bitterness against God, a grumpiness against your situation. Jonah felt this in Jonah chapter 4. You don't have to turn there, but you remember the scene. Jonah was grumpy about taking the gospel of God's grace to people who'd never heard it. He was grumpy when God was merciful to them and they repented. He was grumpy when God had him in the sunshine. He was looking out over the city in his bitterness and complaining against the Lord, and God provided shade. And then a worm was provided by God to take away the shade, and Jonah was grumpy again. This ingratitude produced in Jonah these situational mood swings. He was happy, and then he was angry. That's because his temperament was governed by his circumstances. He wasn't able to see God's good hand in all things. Ingratitude produces these situational mood swings. And ingratitude produces a forgetfulness of grace. If you were to trace out all the times the words remember and forget are used in your Old Testament from Deuteronomy forward, you'd make a very long list because the, the histories, the narrative histories, and then the prophets in the Old Testament all look back on the promises of God bound up in the Pentateuch, in Deuteronomy in particular. And Moses in Deuteronomy, preaching that last sermon before the people go into the land, is saying, you, you need to remember, don't forget, you will forget, and God will remember that you forgot, and he'll visit upon you all the curses. And so everything after Deuteronomy just harkens back to it and says, you failed to remember. And we're not talking about mental cognizance here. We're, we're talking about the kind of remembrance that's grounded in gratitude for God's grace, and you forgot it. To forget God's grace is a tragic aspect of this unbelief. Turn to Luke chapter 17. We have here a scene where Jesus, as the God-man on the earth during his earthly ministry, 
portraying his power over disease, heals 10 guys, 10, 10 men who had been afflicted with leprosy. A terminal and degenerative and ostracizing illness that made your body fall apart from the outside. Verse 11, it happened while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing through Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 leprous men stood at a distance and they met him. They raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go wash yourselves or go show yourselves to the priest. And it happened as they were going, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he'd been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to Jesus. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was there no one found who turned back to give glory to God? Notice what Jesus calls this gratitude, glorifying God. No one turned back but this foreigner. And he said to him, stand up and go, your faith has saved you. That's an interesting turn. We just went from a physical healing to eternal spiritual salvation and a kind of physical renewal that only the regenerate will experience into the eternal state. The ingratitude of the nine is almost hard to believe when you read the story. I mean, you, you read this and you think, I, I'm healed. My, I got my fingers back. <laughs> And, and, and this disease that was going to take my life that had removed me from my friends and my family and made me an outcast is gone and done. <clears throat> oh, Jesus, thank you. And only one responded that way. Did the others feel entitled to the benefits of Messiah because they were Jews? Did the Samaritan who was already ostracized in multiple ways feel the, the depth of his need and respond in gratitude to Christ. Whatever's going on, something works in the heart of this tenth, and he comes back to Jesus with gratitude. What does Jesus refer it as? Um, he gave glory to God, and he was saved. He not only experienced a healing from leprosy, but he was saved from unbelief. Jesus says, your faith has saved you. This man has faith. There's a contrast intentional to the others in verse 19. If you are an unbeliever, you are by definition living a life of ingratitude. But if you're in Christ here this morning, no doubt you, you have the residue of your former life outside of Christ. You are living in what we call this mixed condition. Older theologians talked about two natures. But you recognize that you have to fight the battle of unbelief in the heart as a believer. Part of that battle is a battle against ingratitude. How do we do that? As we move into thinking positively about gratitude in the next section here this morning, I want to start with the remedy, the fundamental remedy. If you're an unbeliever and you recognize, I don't acknowledge my creator at all, you need to get saved. You need to believe in Jesus. You need to surrender your life to him, recognize that his death on a cross pays for your sin, and that's the only way to get your sins paid for. One of those sins being the fundamental ingratitude of living on God's earth and not acknowledging Him. It's the only way that eternal justice against such ingratitude gets cared for, paid for, taken care of, satisfied. And so if you're not in Christ, you need to be in Christ. You need to surrender your life to Him and embrace by faith His death in your place. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, what is the remedy for residual ingratitude in your heart that comes out in murmuring and complaining and grumbling and a lack of joy and increasing faithlessness? First of all, you just need to recall what you deserve. Turn to Lamentations chapter 3. If you don't have Lamentations 3.39 underlined, and if you're looking for Lamentations, you're allowed to use the table of contents. That's okay. It's right after Jeremiah. Jeremiah is kind of big. Lamentations is right after that. 
And Lamentations is a dark, acrostic Hebrew poem sung by Jeremiah as he sat on a hill overlooking Jerusalem during a siege when the, the armies encamped against Jerusalem had surrounded it and starved out the people so that they even resorted to awful means just to try to survive. And Jeremiah says, why should any living person or any man complain in light of his sins? When you think about your sin before a holy God, that eviscerates ground for complaint in total. It removes all foundations for ingratitude. If you just stop and ask the question, what do I deserve? And let the Bible answer the question. And then you say, what am I getting instead? Because listen, you are not getting what you deserve. There is no one on this earth presently who is getting what he or she deserves from the Lord. You wanna talk about entitlement. What are we entitled to? the wrath of God being poured out, terminating in endless conscious torment in the lake of fire. In fact, if, if we were to get what we deserve, the justice of God demands that the punishment we be doled out for eternity. That is the only way to do the math on what we deserve. And so if you're sitting here this morning, believer or unbeliever, you're not getting what you deserve. You are getting so much grace, so much kindness, so much mercy from the Lord and patience. And you only get that equation right when you think about your sin before a holy God. That's the point of Lamentations 3.39. And I probably need to just write Lamentations 3.39 on a 3 by 5 card and put it on my rear view mirror in my car or whatever place I'm liable to complain in my heart or grumble with my lips. Listen, if you're in a great marriage, thank the Lord. If you're in a difficult marriage, thank the Lord. If you have wonderful children, thank God. If you have trying children, thank God. Friends, we are not getting what we deserve. No one in this life gets what we deserve. Let's talk about gratitude. Gratitude is regular in the songs and prayers of the Bible. And I'm going to read all of them to you this morning so that you understand. No, I'm not. There's no way to do that. Uh, let's highlight just a couple. Uh, open the Psalms. That's a great place to see the entire congregation of Israel directed toward their songbook and commanded to give thanks. Uh, thanksgiving is modeled by the songwriters, and we see songs uh, in 2 Samuel and Ezra and the Psalms and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, uh, where the, the, the prophet or the songwriter just bursts out into thanksgiving to God. Uh, look at Psalm 105, <clears throat> verse one. Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, call upon his name, make known his acts among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, muse on all his wondrous deeds. These commands to give thanks to God, to give, pranks, to, to give praise to Yahweh, not pranks, that's another holiday, give praise to Yahweh, for all his wondrous deeds, to recognize who he is and what he's done, and then to say it out loud together to the nations. That's a command, and it is so appropriate. It's appropriate for God's people to model this before a watching world. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, praise be to you. Thank you. Ought to be on our lips all the time. People around us, ought to look at Christians and say, oh, they're so thankful. Boy, if I had cancer, I wouldn't be saying that. What's wrong with those people? 
This is the song of God's people. This, this is to be on our hearts. This is to be on our lips. This is to be our testimony before a watching world. Turn to Psalm 111 and verse 1. Praise Yah, short for Yahweh. I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my heart. Listen, this gratitude isn't merely ceremonial. Listen, you could turn on the radio, uh, put on a record, however it is you listen to music, and you can sing at the top of your lungs to your favorite melody, and you know, you told your dad when you were a kid, I don't really pay attention to the lyrics, dad, I just like the beat. You can sing brainlessly. And we can do that in church. We can get together. We can be led in wonderful music. We can be moved by melodies. There are familiar words and they just come uh, out of our memories, out of our lips, into the air. But what is the command of Psalm 111.1? With all my heart, with all the inner man, give thanks to Yahweh to the self-existent, covenant-keeping God of the Bible. This ought to be all-consuming from the inside, this attitude of thanksgiving. I keep wanting to say attitude of gratitude. It's overused and it rhymes. It's just there in my brain. These are the songs of Israel. They are modeled for the people, they are sung to the nations, and they are prescribed as commands. Give thanks. Be grateful, feel it, sing it. That's what God's people were to be marked by. Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. I think this is so interesting. that This gratitude expressed was so critical to the spiritual life of the nation that you actually had people assigned to the task. 1 Chronicles 16, verse 4. And he made some of the Levites ministers before the ark of Yahweh, even to bring remembrance and to thank and praise Yahweh, the God of Israel. Look at verse 7. Then on that day, David first assigned Asaph and his relatives to give thanks to Yahweh. What is this? This is a government job. Uh, what is your official government position? You are in the administration, uh, minister of thanksgiving. You're the director of thanksgiving. Your, your job is to go before the people and thank Yahweh out loud. Here's your paycheck. It, it, it actually was prescribed and funded by the nation in their tax system to provide a living for people whose occupation was to thank God to lead the people in it. This was so important to the nation as a theocracy that it became the description of a government worker. And these workers are assigned in 1 Chronicles, in 2 Chronicles, in Nehemiah, in, in successive generations of Israel's government administration, you had professional thinkers to lead the nation in this. This, of course, was a spontaneous response to grace not only is it commanded and in some, some cases assigned as a government job, but, but when people experienced God's grace, they turned and gave thanks to him. We read that in Luke 17 with the leper who was healed. In Luke 18, you have a man expressing thanksgiving in a bad way. This is the Pharisee who stands up in the temple in the middle of a crowd, out loud, and the text says he prays to himself. Maybe an indication that his prayers didn't get very far uh, above his head. And he says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this sinner, this tax collector over here. Is that really a, a, a thankfulness to God? That is a, a boastful praise in a legalistic unbeliever. And he's boasting in his thanksgiving prayer. Thanksgiving was to be regular in the lives of, of God's people. We discover in Daniel, when he was in Babylonian captivity, he would open his windows and three times a day, just as he always did, towards Jerusalem, he would thank God. I don't know about you, I, if I were stolen from my home 
in my early teens and hauled off to enemy territory and held captive for my entire life, would I express gratitude? That's what Daniel did. Based on faith in God's promises, rejoicing in God's provision and care for him, even under captivity and persecution. Thanksgiving is commanded throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Be thankful. That, that's at the heart level, internally, as a disposition. And then he says, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, with all wisdom and teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. Now that internal disposition comes out in the corporate assembly. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So then, not only in the internal disposition, but then in the singing in the corporate assembly, but in all of your activities doing things with gratitude to God. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What is God's will for your life? 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What should I be doing right now? Giving thanks. What about the next moment? Giving thanks. What about tomorrow? Giving thanks. Listen, this thanksgiving is practiced by the heavenly beings in Revelation 4 and Revelation 11. Uh, they express gratitude to God in their songs. This thanksgiving is modeled by Jesus, which is fascinating. In Matthew 15, 36, uh, Mark 8, John 6, all record Jesus' feeding of the masses miraculously. He receives a little bit of bread and a couple of fish. And what does Jesus do with those things? He holds them up and he gives thanks for them. Here is God the Son on the earth thanking God the Father for the provision. And what does Jesus do next? Instantaneously, ex nihilo, out of nothing, creates fish and bread for the masses to eat. So he models... He, He's the maker of all things. He's the sustainer of, of all things. Nothing is created apart from him. And he's expressing gratitude for the Father's provision in this moment of these things. And, and in John 6, 23, in summary of the feeding of the 5,000 in that scene, John again tells us that these other things happened after Jesus had, had fed the multitudes and given thanks. I've always sort of seen that as a throwaway statement, but, but when you zero in on how much gratitude is expressed in the Bible, all of a sudden that stands out. John said it again. In other words, Jesus giving thanks to the Father was not the ceremonial thing you have to do before you eat. It was actual, from the heart, expression of the appropriate response of a human on God's earth to everything that God provides. Jesus taught it. He modeled it. Interestingly, Jesus thanked God for drink and for food in that upper room at that last meal. That's a sobering one. He lifted up the cup and he gave thanks. He broke the bread and he gave thanks. What was he expressing gratitude for? For these symbols of food and drink which represented his own suffering as the sin bearer in place of the ones he came to love. He was expressing gratitude for his own infinite suffering for what it would bring about in God's perfect plan. 
Turn to John 11. Jesus here gives us a template for thinking about the range of things for which we are to be grateful. In John eleven fifteen, 15, Jesus says to the disciples, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there in Bethany where Lazarus was. That's a stunning statement. Because if Jesus had been where Lazarus was, no doubt Jesus would have healed Lazarus like he healed everybody else. And Lazarus was a friend that Jesus loved. How could Jesus not be moved by compassion for his friend in the presence of the tyranny of death and sickness and decay overtaking the one that he loved when everywhere Jesus went, moved by compassion while being pursued by those who wanted to kill him, he'd heal, he'd heal, he'd heal. And Jesus says, I'm glad I wasn't there for Lazarus. In other words, Jesus let him die. He, he stayed away four days so that it was clear that Lazarus was dead. Jesus expresses gladness. That's not where we put the word glad. But Jesus says, I was glad for your sakes that I wasn't there with Lazarus. Why? So that you may believe. See, in the plan of God, you and I don't know what God is doing with hard things that provoke our complaining that terminate in glorious things that promote belief. Jesus embraces it. Jesus is glad for it for the sake of the disciples. What do we want? Don't let my brother die. Lazarus on his sickbed going, oh, where's Jesus? And Jesus is glad that Lazarus is sick unto death because it's not a sickness that ends in death, it's a sickness that ends in the glory of the sun by proving that he has credentials over death. We just don't know what God's plan is. Our gratitude has to be rooted in faith. This gratitude for food is appropriate. Acts 27, 35, Paul, after all the sailors on the ship that's going down, finally pulls out some stale bread, breaks it in front of the guys. Breaking bread has more meaning when the bread's really old. And he holds it up and he says to this ship full of unbelievers, God, thank you for this. That's good. What a great testimony it is when we're about to eat or maybe when you're halfway through a meal and you realize how good it is and you know what to thank God for, that in front of a watching world of unbelievers who are ungrateful to God, your table just stops and, and, and somebody says out loud, God, thank you for this double-double. That's appropriate. That's biblical. It's good. Paul expressed gratitude to unbelieving human instruments like Felix, the governor, in Acts 24.3. Uh, Paul expressed thanksgiving for blessings in Acts 28.15. He expressed thanksgiving for hardships. Paul was thankful for feasting and fasting and observing days and not observing days, all with gratitude to God and consideration for others. When you think about the, the two questions, what do I deserve and what do I get instead? I'm, I'm reminded of John Bradford. John Bradford was killed July 1st, 1555 by Bloody Mary at the stake in Smithfield. Uh, you can go there today and see the little plaque commemorating his name. You can see the window that Mary would have looked out on while John Bradford burned. And, and he was given a, a new shirt, a bright white linen that was like a wedding garment. And they said he went to his own burning at the stake like one going to his own wedding. He was rejoicing. And John Bradford was famous for this little phrase. Whenever he would see some drunkard in the curb, whenever he would see some, some profligate sinner who was suffering the consequences of his sin visibly, he would say, but for the grace of God, there goes John Bradford. He knew that he had in himself the potential to be just like anybody else under the consequences of sin and the wrath of God. And he just expressed gratitude. That's me, but for grace. It's a wonderful refrain. This was a regular expression of Paul. He, he thanked, in his letters, he thanked the believers for being believers, which that's just interesting. Um, and often he thanked God for their being believers, which is really theologically interesting. I mean, if somebody hears the gospel and they believe, 
We ought to confine all of our gratitude to them. I'm so thankful that you heard the gospel and you surrendered to Christ. Way to go, thanks be to you. But much more often in the New Testament, I thank God that when you heard the word of God, you received it not as the word of men, but as the word of God, he says to the Thessalonians. I thank God that you believed. Now, who gets the credit for human belief? God does. Why? Because God produced it. It is a gift through and through from beginning to end. And so it's appropriate for us to thank God when people believe. And Paul does that in nearly every one of his letters. An interesting one is 1 Corinthians. Turn there. If you read 1 and 2 Corinthians, these two letters indicate that, that these people were difficult for Paul. They, they, they tried him. Look at verse 4. 1 Corinthians 1, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all word and all knowledge, even as the witness about Christ was confirmed in you, you're not lacking any gift, eagerly awaiting the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul thinks about the Corinthian believers who really despised him, ridiculed him, didn't take his advice, didn't take his apostolic authoritative directives. They thought he was a nobody. He said, I think about you every day and I thank God for you. That's instructive. Look at 2 Corinthians 2.14. Paul says there, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and manifests through us the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. We are a fragrance of Christ. That sounds like an easy thing to give God thanks for. We are victors, except that the language of this scene portrays the triumphal procession of a Roman general marching into Rome to receive his awards from the emperor And he's bringing behind him all the slaves of conquest, all the captured soldiers of the enemy armies who will be slaughtered on the spot in downtown Rome as a pictorial display to the people of Rome of the victory of Rome. They're all going to be slaughtered there. And it's just an interesting scene. What what is a Christian? Following in Christ's train, but we smell like death to the world. Paul's been persecuted, beaten up, prosecuted, imprisoned, stoned and left for dead. I mean, all these things he faced for his faithfulness to Christ. And he says, I thank God for that. James would teach us to be thankful for trials. Moses, in Numbers eleven twenty nine, 29, was thankful that other people spoke for God besides himself. You know, God made Moses his spokesman in many ways. And and people came up to Moses and said, wait, these other people are prophesying. Moses says, are you jealous for my sake? Would that everyone would speak for the Lord and the people of Israel. Moses was thankful when the glory and the credit and the prominence was dispersed away from him to everybody else. In the next chapter, uh, God says Moses was the humblest man on the earth. Actually expressing gratitude. And this kind of gratitude came out in the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, where some who were preaching Christ out of a motive to harm Paul, Paul says, I'm thankful Christ is preached. Ephesians 5.20 says, we are to give thanks to God for everything. Paul gave thanks to God in 1 Corinthians 1.14 that he didn't baptize anybody except Crispus and Gaius. Why was that? Because at Corinth, the the prominence, the prestige was attached to who taught you, who was your favorite orator, or who even baptized you. Paul said, I'm thankful to get none of that. So I'm thankful I didn't even baptize these people. If you've been around Tom Angstead, and many of you have known Tom, been discipled by Tom, maybe you've been given homework by Tom. One of Tom's favorite homework assignments is take out a sheet of paper, write down a hundred things you're thankful for. Come back to me next week. How many of you had that assignment? Anybody? Okay. It was regular. 
You come back the next week, and whatever presenting problem for expert counselor you thought you had just sort of evaporates in gratitude. Maybe you had other problems you had to deal with. But there's something really remarkable about the exercise of writing down a hundred things you're thankful for, and maybe it was specific to a situation. There's this difficult person in my life, Tom Angstead. Write down a hundred things you're thankful to God for them. One, this is going to be a long assignment. And if you do the assignment, your heart gets reworked. This is critical for us. What does unceasing gratitude expose in our hearts? What does it reveal about our theology? That we are dependent upon God, that we are recipients of undeserved grace. What does this kind of gratitude produce in the Christian life? Stability. Trust. A steadiness that just says, my God has taken care of every one of my needs. He never fails. I've been thinking about it. I've been musing on his deeds. I have been singing about who he is and what he's done. I say, thank you, Lord, all the time. Give thanks without ceasing, Ephesians 5.20. I love Paul's motivation in Philippians 3.12. What was his motivation to run the Christian race? Because Jesus Christ has made me his own. That's motivation for us to endure anything with gratitude. I get to belong to him. Could anything be better than that? I have all I need. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you make us be grateful people? Uh, we, we need to remember our slavery in Egypt. We need to remember daily provision of manna. We need to remember a promised land. We would need to remember the cross. We need to remember what we deserved. But even more than remembering that we need to practice the discipline, maybe we need to pay people professionally to say thank you all the time just to remember that we need to be people who express gratitude to you in all things. Help us with this. Overcome our unbelief. Overcome our complaining and grumbling and ingratitude for your glory. That a watching world might see that we have everything in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.